it takes a long time to reach some goals and you have to have patience and people that rush towards a giant goal will ultimately always fail because they don't have the intermediate stepping stones that they need to to gain that knowledge and experience james welcome to the show the iron cowboy is here with us today and i'm really excited about this so thanks so much for joining us Thanks, Chris. Glad to be here. And, and many reviewers probably won't know, but we crossed paths many moons ago. You just showed me the picture. It's pretty cool. You never know who you're going to cross with, uh, cross paths with on your journey. And uh, obviously that was six years ago. So cool to reconnect, brother. Absolutely. You know, and back then you had just finished, you know, the 50, 50, 50. It was, it, <laughs> I thought that was the insanity. 50 Ironmans, 50 days in 50 consecutive or 50 states in 50 days insanity and i remember you were telling the story from stage and then you that wasn't enough because then you did conquer 100 where you did 100 iron mans in 100 consecutive days so yeah. you just either love punishment or there's a lot <laughs> more to it and that's what i want to get into so james you know what i'd like to do is just kind of go back in time a little bit so you know you weren't always you know the iron cowboy running these crazy things and setting guinness book of world records you, you were you were just a normal guy a normal mortgage broker doing quite well and then all of a sudden i, I believe it was the great recession slapped you in the face yeah. hit you like a mac truck and all of a sudden you had to figure things out so how did you go from a wrestler when you were younger to, you know, being a mortgage broker and just, you know, providing for your family, living the normal life to now you are doing these insane things. Where was that? Like, how did that happen? Yeah, I think rock bottom happened. <laughs> I and uh, I, I just did a, a show recently with uh, Ed Milet and uh, we, we talked about um, in the moment we can't see it, but rock bottom is an amazing place to be. Um, because it strips us and makes us completely vulnerable. And now we get to decide what we're going to do. And it builds a ton of character. And those that fight out of rock bottom tend to be some of the most successful people out there. And I, I said this on the Ed Milet podcast too, like I want to congratulate anybody that is facing intense adversity right now and feels like they're at rock bottom because you get to choose. Now, if you fight your way out of this, man, you're the, the, the possibilities are endless. You basically have a clean um, a portrait or landscape now, or canvas, clean canvas to create whatever you want. And that's exactly what happened to us is we lost everything in that economic crash. And uh, I mean, you, you talk about take, losing your home, your vehicles, selling all your possessions to put food on the table for your five kids, can't uh, turn your heat on and you actually go get a, a physical lump of coal to put in the fireplace so you can sleep all night long so you don't have to restock it. Uh, though That's rock bottom, right? I mean, that, that's it right there. I remember waking up one day, it was so cold, my sheets, the kids would sleep in the front room. We only had a one bedroom. The kids would sleep in the front room in front of the coal fireplace. And my wife and I were in our little bit colder room. I remember waking up one morning and the sheets were frozen to the wall that, that oh went over the gosh. top of the bed. And so that outside cinder block wall was just so cold. Uh, that's rock bottom, right? And my wife and I, we had a lot of conversations and we're like, okay, that was the past. The past doesn't define us. Now, who do we want to be? And let's figure out a game plan to get after that. And we never know. And this is, you and I talked about this before we went on. It takes a long time to reach some goals and you have to have patience. And people that rush towards a giant goal will ultimately always fail because they don't have the intermediate stepping stones that they need to, to gain that knowledge and experience. So. Long story short is we had an opportunity once we were at ultimate rock bottom to recreate our future on this blank canvas. I think that's great. And, you know, I remember 2008, I also hit rock bottom. I didn't have a lump of coal, but I had to actually <laughs> ask my, well, you know, you've met my, my wife now, Larissa. I had to ask her when she just moved into my house, she was like that token girlfriend. I had to say, sweetie, can you help me pay the mortgage, the utilities? And would you mind if my buddy Pete moves into that bedroom and my friend <laughs> Jessica moves into that bedroom? That was 08. But then see in 14, I repeated the cycle and I lost it all again. And that was my rock bottom. So I can relate. And, you know, you make a comment and I'm hopefully going to get this right. You said, I stopped chasing society's dream and I went after 
my dreams. Now, here's where I want to go with this. You know, I am a firm believer that there's only one real difference between people that succeed and people that don't succeed at their dreams. And that one differentiator is they create. They create the destiny they want. They create the future they want, and they go after it. The ones that don't conform to what other people tell them their life should look like. They conform to other people's ideologies. You are at a breaking point, coal heating your house, ice freezing your sheets. You had to make a choice. You very easily could have just said, you know what? This isn't working. I'm going to conform. But you didn't. You chased your dreams. Why? Yeah, th- it would have been yeah, so much that. easier to conform. It's just you- way, way more easier. And I would have been comfortable. And I would still be comfortable now, but I wouldn't be living the life that I am now with the freedoms that I have. It took longer, but that long uh, effort was worth the wait. Now, here's the other thing, too, is like, so people can not only do they conform, but they look around and they see what the current standard of excellence is out there and they try to hit that benchmark. And I just did an interview the other day where they someone asked me and they said, hey, um, who's your role model and who do you try to emulate? And I say, I kind of feel like I live in a bubble and I don't model what I do after anybody else because that would put imposed limits on me. I'm not trying to reach your standard. I'm trying to set a new standard. And if we go out and we look at what other people are doing, we are potentially limiting our potential and what we can accomplish. And so for me, it was super important to like not do what others are doing. Because when we did the 50, kind of the current standard of like, wow, was five consecutive. So one would think, oh man, if that's the current standard of wow, if I do 10, I'm gonna double what the standard is, right? And I looked at it and, it's, and I said, no, 10 doesn't scare me. And it wasn't 20, it wasn't 30, it was 50. And then I was like, that doesn't scare me either. Let's throw in logistics travel. Let's do one in every single state. And you know what? Let's throw my five kids, ages six to 12 in a motor home and bring them with me, right? Because now we're setting a bar of what's possible. I wasn't comparing myself against what somebody else thought I could do. So that's the problem is one, we get complacent, we take the easy road and then you know, we're, we, we settle and then we're comparing ourselves against what everybody else is doing. Don't compare yourself to anybody. Salary caps are for professional sports, not for entrepreneurs. And we're going to carry that same thing. Creation versus conformity through this entire show, because it's, it's a very great comparison to what you did. So let's go right into 50, 50, 50. You had just done that right before I had met you out in San Diego. So you came up with 50 because that's what scared you. The 50, and, and actually, I don't think it was 50, wasn't it? Wasn't it one more or was it the 100 that was one more? The 100. Okay, yeah. we're going to hit that because I think that's freaking awesome. So you yeah. come up with the number that scares you, but then you did. You went to your trainer, you went to other people and you started asking them, what do you think? What were the responses from the other people that were in your circle that believed in you? I mean, in that initial no, they, thing, how did they, they react? They, they didn't believe in me. My, my trainer said, you can't do it. And I thought to myself, well, I'm not going to find any trainer that thinks I'm, I can do it. So I'm going to stick with you Andy, because you're brilliant. And then, and then I, I went and I talked to some doctors and they said, well, you're going to die. And I was like, okay, I'm, I'm done talking to doctors. Like this isn't going to work either. And so it just proves my point of you have to surround yourself with people that have your belief and mindset. And you can't listen to people that don't have the same purpose, the same experience or anything that you have and believe is possible. I've learned at a super high level, perspective and perception are an amazing thing. And the perception at what we do for someone that just tuned into my story, a hundred consecutive Ironmans, right? That's absurd. What they don't realize is it started over a decade ago. You... Oh, yes. You. Good one, man. Yeah. Those feel good. Yeah. That feels amazing. Um, but they don't realize that there's a decade before that of stepping stones, learning and growth and adversity to where, and I call it, you can't go from zero to a hundred. And, you know, so that inner circle, they, they didn't believe in what we were doing. And really it was myself, my wife, obviously my kids, I could get them on board pretty easy. And then only two other guys, we called them the wingmen, Casey and Aaron. And really, it really, it was the four of us that had the belief and we, I got them to drink the Kool-Aid really hard and that's what you have to do. And they believed in it. They never wavered. And they were, they've been involved with me for close to a decade now. 
Oh, it's fantastic. And, and I remember in the documentary, like it's you and your daughter drawing it out, being like, how are we going to do this logistically? Oh, we have to start in Hawaii and then backtrack through that. I mean, the lines on that thing were insane. So you come up with that, but you know, doing something real, real, like real, 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 real quick, we've please. built our dream. We've built our dream home. And as a reminder, that original map with the lines on it is hanging in our stairwell to remind us that sometimes you just have to have no idea how something's going to happen. And you start with a dry erase marker on a map and you sit your kids down and you say, what adventures can you guys lay out here and let's go do that. And again, we had no idea what we were doing. No clue. We didn't have, I didn't have sponsors. We had lost everything in the economy. We we're on a shoestring budget. Uh, my wife was graduating from, from, from university the week before we leave on this campaign. I was just unimaginable working both ends of the candle. But it's funny that that map is literally hanging in my house with the original lines and numbers and everything on it. I, I cherish it because it really was the beginning of a journey where I had no idea what we were doing. And, you know, you chose the right person to sit down and do that map with. You chose your daughter, kids, children. They don't have the disbeliefs that we do. They haven't had they to have go limits. through conformity. No limits. So your no daughter's limits. looking at this and like, dad, yeah, we'll start here. We'll go here, 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 here. You'll be just fine. We got this, dad. Because yep. there are no limits. They don't have limits. They don't have barriers. And they don't have disbelief. You, you didn't have to convince her. You just pointed her in a direction. And she took you on the journey. Yep. You didn't take her on the journey. I, I absolutely. Love that, one, of the, one of the things I love to say from stage is I'll tell a few stories and then I'll say, when as adults, did we stop dreaming? Man, I love when that. as adults, did we stop putting limitations on what is possible? Because we start to conform and, and develop these belief systems based on what everybody else is doing. Kids don't have that, Bingo. right? Kids have an insane amount of belief and conviction. And, and I love it that my kids have been involved with this from the beginning, because from the beginning, they were my number one supporters because they didn't have any outside influence saying, no, you can't do that. That's impossible. They just said, oh, dad, think that's possible. Yeah, that's possible. We can do that. And they got on board and they were my number one cheerleaders and fans. And as a group collectively, we all believed it was possible and we were successful in doing so. You know, and they say hope is one of the most powerful things. You had hope, belief, and you had the support of the one, well, you had the family unit and two friends, but your daughter had that ability to see this thing and dream it. And I, man, I love that because you're absolutely well, and, correct. And what was amazing about Lucy, um, she was 12 when the 50 happened and she, there's some amazing stories about Lucy. Um, and you can watch the documentary or get the, uh, grab the book and you can get those stories in detail. But when we did the 100 most recently, she was 18 and she ran the entire campaign um, and she did an unbelievable job with social, with my sponsors, with the contracts, with everything. And so she has seen it. And since then, she's graduated and I've hired her full time. She's running all things Iron Cowboy. Yeah. I mean, that's who we went through to do this. I thought it was fantastic. Yep. I mean, th just the, the things she's learning, the lessons she's being able to see and the journey she's been on with this whole dream is just something that. Most kids that, you know, fall into the regular classifications of living, you know, inside that, I don't want to call it a box, but, you know, that traditional way they miss all this stuff. So I think she's just going to just continue to excel. Well, let's get to I the, say, I'll, 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 I'll say, I'll say one more thing that kids are a product of our environments. Mm -hmm. And so as a parent, it's our responsibility and you've got a young one. So they watch you like a hawk. And so oh, yeah. every, be careful with every single action you take and every word that you say, because they take it as truth. I got to be careful with the words, but you know, at 44 years old, you know, I still skate on a weekly basis and everybody tells me, oh, you're going to get hurt. You're too old for that. I said, you know what, if I'm too old for this, if I gave this up, what's the point? Like, this is what I grew up doing. This is what I love. Same with snowboarding. It's, but my daughter will never see the day where dad says, oh, sweetie, I'm too old or I'm too sore. No way. Sweetie, you want to go to the park? Absolutely. Dad's well, never that, that was exactly. That was exactly our mindset. I mean, my wife and I, uh, I'm 45 and I've done the, the arguably the greatest endurance feat in sports history at that age. I don't believe there's a limit. I still believe there's more in me. And my wife and I had all six, five kids in six and a half years because we wanted to be young grandparents. We wanted to be able to play with our kids, play with our grandkids. And, and so Sunny, by the time she was 28, had all five kids. And so Sunny has, uh, our kids are now 12 to 19 and she's only 40. 
Wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, and it's so dang fun, man. Man, I started late, but that's all right. I'm young at heart. And you there know, you go. I, I said this to somebody the other day. I'm at the park, and this older guy's there that I knew from back in the day. And he's like, Oh, you know, I'm so old. It's hurt so bad. And, you know, he's coming up with all these excuses why he's not doing this. And I, I just looked at him and I said, You're here. Stop Change thinking about it. exactly. You're here. Drop in and go. If you get hurt, you'll feel alive, man. You'll know why you're doing this. You are going to get hurt. It's not going to feel good. Good. You're alive. Wake up and see what you are on this earth to do. Yep. Oh, man. Does, that just Every, gets so every, fired up on that stuff. Everybody asks me what's next. And I'm always like, okay, stop. Because the, I, I, I'm going to die if I keep going. But they always say what's next because they just crave pushing boundaries. And they're scared to push limits and boundaries in their own lives. And so they want a front row seat to me doing it. And so I am totally satisfied. And I know we're going to get into the hundred, um, but I, I'm completely satisfied and very proud of that accomplishment. So my answer, because I know you're going to ask it, I'll answer it now. What's next is to live a very meaningful life well into my one hundreds. And I believe that is possible. Uh, I believe it takes attention to detail. I believe I will be still riding my bike and competing in the JD and beyond. Yeah. And, you know, I was going to get to that, but I'm just going to bring it out. Charity, giving purpose. I don't know where those three words came from, but I wrote them down on a piece of paper with my notes that I want to talk about. And some of the things that you're doing are far beyond what people would think you're doing this for. Maybe some people think it's your ego. Some people think, oh, it's the money. It's got to be the money. We're going to, we're going to get into that. And there other is people, no, there is no money in, in suffering. I promise you there's no money in suffering. But, I get, I get emails. I get messages all the time. Hey, I want to, I want to ride. I'm, I'm 40. I want to ride my bike across the country. Uh, help me get sponsors. And I'm like, nobody cares. Yeah. Like you, you've got to do it for you. It's got to be, you have to be the reason you want to do it. And then I always attach a charitable component to it because I want to do things b bigger and larger than myself. But you were ridiculed for that. You were beat up from that. You know, I wore a special shirt. For those of you listening, you can't see it, but it says I wore it just for today. Haters need hugs too. You <laughs> had a lot of haters in that I first did. journey and maybe even the 100, but you know, when you, you came up with the big audacious goal to, you know, do the 50, you had to raise money. So you, 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 you did find a sponsor, but what was the journey like when you, you had this plan, you guys, everybody was on board. Now you're like, great. We have to fund an RV, the, the cars, the team, the food, the, I mean, that's a ton of logistics. Like that probably has a big old price tag to it. And you just came out of, you know, a, a very hard bottom. So what, yep. what was that like? Like you got this great idea. You're so fired up. Now all of a sudden you got to actually find the money, the tool that's going to make this yep. whole engine work for you. Like, how did that happen? Yeah. So here's what I refuse to do. And it's to take fundraising dollars that we say is for a charity and then put it towards the actual camp cost of the campaign. Any dollar we've ever raised goes a hundred percent to the charity. I fund the projects through personal funds sacrifice and also sponsors dollars that are allocated for projects. So none of the money for project goes into the um, sponsorship funds raised. And here's what a lot of people don't realize. The, there's a two year span where we hit rock bottom, we're building back out. Um, I had an opportunity, uh, one of my athletes that I was coaching said, hey, um, my mother is sick, she has Alzheimer's, and we need someone to take care of her. And by doing so, we'll cover the rent and utilities for the home. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. Then we talked to Sunny and we talked about it. And we ended up moving my family of seven into the basement of her home. And mostly my wife cared for her for two years. And I was working, she was working, we were doing what we could, but we had no expenses. And we only had one car for a family of seven. And it was a, it was a five-seater Mazda that we would either do two trips to go places or we cram in. Um, not super safe, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, but a lot of people don't realize is we made that sacrifice and stashed every dollar that we earned um, to pay for the 50. So we funded the RV, the gas, the food, the equipment. A lot of companies are willing to sponsor equipment on a big thing like that and it was such a big production. I got a sponsor to fund the documentary. I got the documentary crew to sweat equity their portion of it. So you have to get creative and you have to provide value for the exchanges that you're doing. But that's, we were heavily ridiculed because people were like, oh no, you're stealing money from a charity. You're, that motor home's not free. And I'm like, you're right, it's not free. But you didn't see the two years of my wife 
you know, wipe, wipe in her butt, you know, and, and taking care of this lady that has, is in a tragic situation of Alzheimer's, right? And so that's what people don't do is they don't get creative. They don't um, sacrifice things they need to do. They just know what they want. They don't know what they're willing to sacrifice. And they just come to a quick assumption, not having all of the information. And that becomes the headline. And then everybody just doesn't take the time because they clickbait headline watch. And then they make assumptions. And you know what happens when people make assumptions. Absolutely. And so, so really, we have been a thousand percent transparent with everything we've done. We have every receipt of every donation ever that's run through us. We, yeah, we can prove everything but more more than anything i'll just give the hater a hug yeah that's what you should do because you know in your 50 i mean you you hit some really hard times you know the crash on the bike i mean there was times where literally like you were just like you, you didn't think you could do it but you had your support system that got you back on and you talk a lot about this and i'm sure a lot of people hear you say this but you isolate your fears so you've got let's take that's that's running and doing the things you do and that's all sports but let's assume that you have an awful lot of fans and an awful lot of followers that are not athletic, that are not going to yeah. run marathons or Ironmans they're, yeah. or triathlons. They're just, they love the motivation of what you're accomplishing. So yeah. isolate your fears. Can we just talk about that for a moment? How, do you, sure. how does that help you? What do you do? And how can people apply that if they're not in the space that you are? Yeah. So fear and anxiety are just an emotion like happiness and excitement. They're just associated with a moment and our brain doesn't know the difference between anxiety and excitement. And so if you start to get anxious about a situation, all you have to do is slow down, stop and think of a positive thing where you'd be excited about it. And your brain goes, oh, I'm not scared. I'm actually excited for this moment. And so those little tricks you can you can do. But when, when, when you mentioned isolating a fear and breaking it down, what I mean by that is like, look, I get it. Um, and different people work in different ways, but for the masses, um, getting over the fear of heights and stepping out of an airplane and jumping is probably not the best way. Most people, some can do it, but that's not suggested, right? What they do is they go, okay, I need to go to the top of this ladder, you know, and, and that's the first thing. And I can do that with somebody helping me and holding my hand and then realize, okay, I'm safe. And so what you do is when you have anxiety or a fear of a task or of something and something's really scary, what you have to do is just like if you have a big goal, right? If you have a big goal, you shelf it. If you have a big fear, you shelf it. And then you reverse engineer all the way down to a task that is manageable and doesn't scare you. And you work your way towards um, the scary goal or thing that gives you uh, anxiety or fear. So what that means is create manageable stepping stones that gain experience and knowledge to the point where the scary thing isn't so scary. Perfect example. I don't go from zero. I don't go from zero to hundred. I don't go from off the couch to hundred consecutive Ironmans. I started with a four mile fun run that I suffered and struggled through. That was my starting point. I couldn't even conceptualize that goal. So I couldn't be scared of it yet. But at that time, an, a single one day Ironman scared the hell out of me because I had just learned to run. I didn't know how to swim. And I started to take the steps towards it to where not only could I conceptualize the goal, we achieved it. And so if you're scared or filled with anxiety, one, it's just an emotion. We need to figure out a trick how to replace that. Mel Robbins 54321 is a great book to read. And then two, um, break it down into imaginable steps where we gain experience and knowledge. And here's one more thing. There's something that's called catastropheism. And that is worried about a event in the future that hasn't yet happened that we are putting all of our focus and attention to. And that generates anxiety and fear. So we need to figure out a way how to avoid catastrophism and not putting energy, any energy into that and controlling what's right in front of us. Same pr principle and concept, control what's right in front of us. Smaller goals, attainable things that I can overcome my fears. I like that. That was really good. And that, that can be applied to any. Thing anyone's doing, you know, you're right. You know, even I tend to find myself doing that. I'm, I focus on something that's not even here in the future that, you know, 
who knows if, if it's going to happen, but you get yourself all worked up over it. And then sometimes you just got to talk yourself off that ladder, if you will, so that you stop focusing on the things that aren't happening and may never to what's happening right now. And that's where action happens. And that's where it, things it, change. It, here's a very simple real life example that just happened to, to my daughter. Um, she, uh, a, a swimsuit company that my daughters love reached out to us and said, Hey, do a post for us. We'll get you some swimsuits. It'll be awesome. And my kids freaked out. We're super excited. They went to the mall. They did this cute little Instagram reel. They filmed it all. They got home, they posted it. And Lucy, <laughs> Lucy had chosen a, um, a, a song with Spanish words in it that she didn't know. And it actually said, will you suck my beep oh, in my it? Goodness. And somebody that spoke Spanish came back and said, hey, uh, that's a cute video. You may not want to use that song. And she had, because she ran out of space on her phone, deleted the original video and lost the footage. And she just like total anxiety, fear that of uh, looking down the road, I'm going to let the sponsor down. This is a total disaster. And she started to panic a little bit. And I was like, stop, reset, take a breath. Sucks. That happened. Validate, right? Sucks that that happened. What's the one thing that, that we're missing? Well, I, I don't have the footage at the mall anymore. Okay. In order to edit, we now have to go get new footage at the mall. What is that going to take? Well, I got to get my sisters. I got to get in the car. I got to go to the mall. That's the only thing you have to worry about. That's the only singular task. You, you, we talked about the book, The One Thing. That's the one thing you need to do right now in order to get back on track. So get in the car, get your sisters, go to the mall, refilm that and come home. Now let's start editing, right? And so it's just that thing where she was like, immediately sponsors are upset. This is happening. This is happening. The whole conversation, ego, ego, all this. And it's not even reality. The sponsors never saw it. It was taken down really fast. Sponsors didn't see it. And we were like, okay, what's the one thing I could do right now to solve this problem? The one that just thing happened. where that, nothing that just, else matters is just yep. go to the mall, right? I love yep, it. That, and, and that happened this week. So, And that's so simple. Like people listening to this, like all of you listening, like think about the simplicity of that. She just had to focus on the one thing where nothing else mattered. And that is how she got it done. But she was so worked up because of something that went wrong that, you know, happened, you know, oh, well, get it, it done. Oh, I love it. I love it. So let, you know, fear and, you know, overcoming and hope and all these things are great. But what happens when you're on day five and you have an injury, a serious injury that could potentially take you out of your big goal, which I believe happened to you. Let's talk about yeah. not the mindset or all that stuff. Like when something physically goes wrong, you break yep. your ankle, you bang your shin up, you, you almost can't continue. How did you push through that? You didn't just do it in the 100, you did it in the 52. Yeah, so the, the 100 is, is really close to ha have, having just happened. And, and the 100, I'm sorry, the 50 wasn't riddled with injury. It was mostly um, exhaustion, fatigue, chaos, and logistics. Obviously, we did have to do a full Ironman a day, but that, that really wasn't what was causing the problems. And the purpose of doing the 50 for me personally was to find my mental and physical limits. Well, I don't think I found my mental and physical limits because there was so much chaos and confusion involved with it. 50 was not my limit for consecutive full distance Ironman triathlons. And so I was like, okay, if I can remove chaos, remove confusion, put systems and team in place, can we double what everybody thought was redefining impossible? And can we defy logic? And I was like, yes, absolutely. So I went through the training camp did everything we could, remote location here in Utah, did it around my home, got community support, everything was perfect. And literally five to 10 days into this thing, I had an ankle injury that led into a shin explosion mm -hmm. that led into a, a hip issue. And I am telling you, I legit thought my leg was gonna break. Every step I took, the pain and the pressure became so much in that left leg, I was waiting for my shin bone to snap. And it got to the point where I would figure out how to take the next step. I would manage the pain, manage the pain, manage the pain. And I would black out because it became too much. My wingman, Casey, would catch me. I'd come back to, and we'd do a little countdown. Okay, five, four, three, two, one. And we'd say, here we go. And as soon as we said, here we go, that was our trigger to get moving again. And then I could manage the pain, manage the pain, manage the pain. I'd black out. And so this repeated all night until we finished the Ironman at the end. Of, I mean, we finished the marathon at the end of the, that long day. Um, and I, 
this is an ex extreme example, but I would ask myself in that, in that moment, is the next step going to kill me? No, right? And then I'd finish that day and I would say to my wife, Sunny, I, I would say, and I remember this, ex ex I knew exactly where I was sitting. I know exactly what she was, was doing, wearing. And I said, I don't think I can manage that level of pain for 85 more days. I think it was day 15. I don't know if I can manage that level of pain for 85 more days. And she said to me, she looked me right in the eyes and she said, James, you're done today. The work is done. Exhale, appreciate what your body did for you today and let the team take care of you tonight. We're gonna wake up tomorrow and we're gonna face tomorrow's challenges as they come. We don't know how you're gonna feel first thing in the morning. And I woke up in the morning and I said, can I get in the water? Yep, it's not gonna kill me. And I got in the water and I started swimming. I get on my bike. James, can you take the next pedal stroke or will it kill you? No, it's not gonna kill me. And so I never had a good enough of a reason to abandon the goal that I'd set out for myself. It was completion or death. And I wasn't gonna accept death. And every time I asked the question, is the next moment going to kill me? The answer is no, well, then I can continue. And I want to put this into perspective, everybody. I don't know if any of you understand what, a, you know, what this is, you know, what this 100 is. And James, I want you to really do it, but it is 14,060 miles, if I'm correct. So correct. Your, your, what mile marker are you at when your shin exploded? Um, well, it would have been day five. So just real quick math, we do 140.6 times five 703 so, you're 703. so if we minus 14,060 I still have 13,357 miles to go and I'm broken I, I just wanted <laughs> to make sure that everybody understood that so what he just said is he complete he got through the day the team's going to work on him then tomorrow's a new day can I get in the water you know without dying yes and that's what drove you but that was at 700 miles of what we just talked about 14,000 miles I just, I just had to pause and put that into perspective for everybody because that's not just normal. That's like, wow. Uh, again, again, perception and the perspective is very different and unique depending on where you are in your journey. And for us having lived through two world records and then the 50, our perspective and perception is very different to what somebody who's just tuning into the 100 for the very first time may be. So now what I want to talk about is I want to talk about bankroll. I mean, running and swimming and doing all these, th there's not a lot of money in that from what I'm told. And I'm in this, the money space. So what avenues do you use to bankroll this whole thing? And then once you figure that part out, like, yeah, how does that work? Because, you know, I know on Instagram, people are asking you, how are you making a living running, biking and swimming all day? Let's hit that yeah. a little bit. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> um, just like in any type of business, I, I make my money in um, coaching athletes and speaking from stage. And we, I speak around the world. I've spoken in 48 different countries. I do 70 plus events a year. Um, and that's how I have, I feed my family. That's how I put food on the table. That's how I keep the lights on. Um, but I have to invest in myself, make sacrifices and accomplish things so that I can tell those stories and teach. I hate it when people and speakers and mentors are teaching based off of somebody else's stories and they don't have the actual experience of having been on that battlefield. And so I said to myself, look, if I'm going to teach these principles, if I'm going to set the ultimate example, if I'm going to lead from the front, I have to go out and do it so that when I'm talking to an NFL team, to they respect me because I've been on the battlefield. I'm not telling somebody else a story. I'm sharing from a personal experience. I've been through hell. I'm not telling you this person has been through hell, you should be able to do it too. No, I've been there, I've done it. And I think that's why I get respected for what I do because I do it first and then I go out and I teach it. But one thing too on your journey that I've seen is while you're doing it and you're out there make, you know, doing this journey, you got people that are definitely hitting you and it got you, it got you pretty bad. People are saying, you know, all this stuff, they're questioning like the way you're doing the training, is that right? You know, like, there were so many things that happened and it's all in your documentary. How much of an impact does that have on your mindset and your, you know, like your dream? Like 
what is that? How, what is that doing to you? Because this is really relative to what we talked about earlier, creation versus conformity. These are people that can't do what you've done. They won't do what you do and never would for any cause, but they're ridiculing you on little things just to make themselves feel big so they can beat their chest. And it has an impact on people. You're doing something great. And someone that's not doing something great is trying to hold you back and get you to conform to whatever it is they think. This is important because especially in the youth, this is a big problem. Our kids are, are being held back from their dreams by people that just yep. simply would never, ever live their own dream. Yep. Number one thing um, that that is where that is coming from is jealousy. Those people are jealous because you are doing something that they want to do and don't have the courage to do. And I think it's great to get bullied, to have that ridicule. Because it allows us, if we have the right mindset and belief in what we're doing, it allows us to build confidence, to not allow other people to influence what we do and how we feel. You, we have to learn, and, and you, can only, you can only learn things through experience. And that's why I think the haters are great. I, I've learned to love them because they give me confidence and courage in what I'm doing. And here's the biggest thing. We had an experience where, where um, we did something that wasn't of popular uh, public opinion. And I looked at it. I did the math. I said, okay, we covered, you know, 7,000 miles. And we, we made a perceived mistake and we used an elliptical trainer for a very small portion of the marathon on one day. And I did all of the math. And the, the time we spent on that machine, it was the day after a very violent crash. Um, it represented 0.24% of the entire journey. And I was this close. This is the biggest lesson that people are going to learn today. And I hope you have stayed tuned in this whole time. I was this close to allowing somebody else's opinion of 0.24% of my journey to derail the entire campaign. Now, since that moment, where they had thought they had an opinion on my journey, we went on to set in sports endurance history two times and have raised close to a million dollars for charity. And my life and my kids' lives have changed forever. We've gone around to speak, like I said, in 48 different countries around the world, impacting hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people and giving them hope on the journey that they're on because of the example that we've set. So in recap, I'll say this one sentence, don't allow somebody else's opinion of 0.24% of your journey impact how you choose to go on and live your life because those people that are behind the keyboard trying to throw hate at you, one, are doing it out of jealousy and two, have no comprehension of the effort, time and sacrifice you've done because it's never been done before. How can you criticize somebody for having never taken one step on the journey that they're on? And that's why I'm a big fan of having empathy for people because we have no idea their past experience and knowledge that create their perception and belief system. Oh my God. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you for bringing that up. I like when I was talking about the haters and I was talking about that, I was hoping I was going to strike a nerd that really got you to talk about that. And you just nailed it, James. <laughs> if money was no issue in your life, what would you be doing? Um, I'd be doing exactly what I'm doing. Um, I'm, it. as soon as I wrap this up, I'm looking at my bike right now. I'm going to go bike over the top of the mountain that we live close to. And, um, and then I'm going to go hang out with my family. We've got a camping trip planned this weekend. And, uh, I, I would, I would hang out with my family. I'd golf a little bit. I'd ride my bike and I would create memories with, with my loved ones. This is a pivotal question, not just for you, but for everybody to ask themselves. If money was not an issue in your life, what would you do? And if you answer it the way that James did, the same thing I'm doing now, nothing would change. You know you're doing something right because you're not being driven by the, the thing called money or these false realities that you create in your mind. I need the Lamborghini. I need the bigger house. I need this. I need that. All those things are shallow promises and shallow dreams that once you get it, you just feel more hollow. I've had a lot of money. I've lost it all. I've had it again. I've lost it all. Material things came and went. And you know what never left? The passion, the thing that I would do for free. Every single time I figured out 
that the one thing that I did that didn't pay me that I did for free was what I got the most enjoyment. So money is just a tool to help all of you get something and help other people get what they need. Because I, James, and I want to end this with a little bit about, you know, what you're doing in the charities and the, the big support you have with human trafficking, because it's a, it's a major problem today. We all need yeah, to start one moment. We all need to start living understanding we are here to solve other people's problems. And if we just focus our time and energy on that, not the money and what it gets us, but focus on if we had money, we would help other people get what they want. If you do that, you'd have everything and anything you ever wanted in life because the universe would give it to you. But too many people are so focused on me, 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 not giving. You don't. I, I, I love that you just said that because people ask me all the time, how do I get motivated? How do I achieve this? How do I get this? And I said, put everything aside and go help somebody. I said, if you help your team and the people around you achieve their goals, it's impossible for you not to achieve the goals and, and the, the, the things, the items, the lifestyle, whatever that you want. It's a byproduct of you helping other people achieve their goals. And guess what? Because you're helping other people get to the top, you're going to have people with you at the top. Because I... I like you, I've made everything, I've lost everything, I've made everything, and it sucks to be at the top by yourself. It's actually super lonely. And so the best thing I can do is bring all of my friends to the top with me by giving them opportunities and helping them build their empires. I don't wanna be up there by myself, it's no fun. You got it, man. So real quick in the final couple minutes here, talk a little bit about what you're doing for charity, for giving and for purpose, because this is a really important thing and you are really taking an active stance. And I think we have to bring this out. Yeah, I've got five kids. Uh, my wife is very passionate and wants to, to help people in our community. She is a very loving and kind human being. She wants the best for everybody. And I know it is shocking to some people out there, especially in the United States, but we live in a time and an era where human slavery and sex trafficking exists in today. And it may not be that American people are getting trafficked, but we are the number one consumer of the product, which is probably part of the bigger part of that problem. Um, and so the local charity Operation Underground Railroad did a ton of research on them. They do sting operations and missions and actually go on site in very dangerous conditions and rescue these girls and these boys from a tragic scenario where they don't know when their suffering is to end. And our little team was so pumped. We raised over half a million dollars during the Conquer 100 project. We're gonna to continue to do stuff for the charity. Um, we just love trying to do everything we can to help other people. And that, that ultimately is what brings joy to us. I love it. The Conquer 100 raised that much money for a charity, for a cause, for a purpose. The Conquer 100 is 100. You did 101. Why? <laughs> yeah. Um, again, we, uh, we, we touched on it a little bit earlier. I, I, I want to set the best example I know how for my kids. And I want to lead from the front. And I don't want to teach something I haven't done. And I teach that no matter how broken you are, how defeated you are, how dark it may seem, we can all get up and do one more. And I, with, with like three days left to go in the campaign, I looked at my wife and I said, I have to do one more. And she said, what? And I said, I, I have to go do 101. And I said, when the celebration is over, we've achieved our goal and I am broken. I am beaten. I am dark. I am in the corner. I can go do one more. And I got up on day 101 when the, the party was over, the goal was accomplished and I was broken and I could have stayed in my bed and slept. I got up and I got in the pool by myself. And I swam 2.4 miles. I got on my bike by myself. I biked 112 miles. And then I ran the full marathon. And we did 140.6 miles one last time. And the, the messaging to that is sometimes you're going to have to get up on your own and do one more. And I don't, I don't know how many times you have to do it, but I promise you, no matter how dark it is, how broken you are, you can get up and do one more because it's not going to kill you. I love it. I got another favor on that ride back up that mountain or that hill that you're going to do at the very top. Can you scream one more? That's all I want yeah. from you. And folks, listen into this right now. I want you all to stop right now what you're doing. I don't care what you're doing. I want you to scream one more. It doesn't matter how broken you are. It doesn't matter what other people think. You 
have one more in you. James, it's been an honor. It's been a privilege. Thank you for being on the Chris Noggle Show. Go get one more, man. Awesome. Thanks, Chris. Love it. Check out the other videos and the other interviews that I've done because you know what? This is just the beginning. And I'm going to do one more just like you are. So go get them, chase your dreams, and don't let anyone stand in your way because the biggest problem in America is not what people don't know. It's what they think they know that just ain't so.